Now we're going to hear from the Relex CEO and co-founder, Miko, as he shares why and how retailers can emerge from the pandemic by returning to pre-COVID efficiency levels with major agility gains. It's all about adapting to win, not just to cope. These insights are critical to fueling profitability and actively moving retail forward. It's my pleasure to welcome Miko to the stage and turn the mic over to him to get the day started. Welcome, Miko. Thank you very much, Sarah. Very happy to be here. Just a couple of minutes briefly on Relax for the people who might not know us very well. So we are retail engineers by heart. I, for example, personally come from research background, having a PhD on retail optimization, as well as my co-founders have a research degree. Now we are a bit over a thousand retail engineers trying to basically improve and perfect retail further continuously. What we do is we develop technology for the purpose of increasing and providing quantifiable improvements in retail. And quite a lot of that is tied to trying to forecast future demand better and then optimize the decisions in the retail processes and supply chains to do on that. One big epitome of what we, what we try to do is by our stand also push the boundaries of optimization further, both on technology and technical edge, as well as on how long pieces of process can our customers optimize in one go. So what everything can be optimized sin, uh, kind of simultaneously. We've been growing constantly. The average growth or growth of companies bit over 50% and, and we see ourselves as the market leader on this. Uh, what we are, what I'm going to share is what I see happening in retail and what's important from the vantage point of us working with over 300 customers in over 16 different countries. We have offices in 12, 12 countries and uh, we work with large retailers and market leaders in over 14 countries with companies like Ahold Bell Hayes, Home Depot and Bed Bath and Beyond here in the US as well as Coles in Australia, Ocean in France, market leaders, Ica, Marcus Spencer in, in Sweden and UK, respectively Rive, Reve and Magnet in Germany, for example, and those. And it's been extremely intriguing 15 years for myself and all of us Relaxians. We've been kind of trying to serve a perfect retail for 15 years now. And what has been a big thing is the amount of change and constant development that's been happening both in the marketplace as well as within the retailers. And if we take a bit of hindsight on how retail has changed, on the left hand side, we can look who were the largest retailers and what were their annual revenues on the year when we started operations in 2006. And then also look at what was the status and situation of the last year in 2020. And we can see that, of course, if we look and analyze on, on the areas, we can see firstly that the biggest retailers have been growing quite a bit on average, more than inflation. The growth rate is well over double the, the market growth rate or, or uh, on those largest retailers. And what I'm asking you is just to take a moment and try to analyze what are the drivers of the growth players? What, what, what's been driving the growth? So what I've been kind of seeing is three things of the biggest winners. Of course, there's lots of econ players that have their game together on the electrom ecom and, and related fulfillment. Then there are some kind of roll-ups or acquisition plays growing via combining current volumes. Then also related to econ, what's very big in the kind of conceptual winners like Aldi's, Watch Group, Lidl, Costco, and so on. Companies that have a very methodological approach 
on their concept and actually trying to optimize the whole of the longer process. And that's also a commonality for, for most of the leading econ players. And that's something, of course, these are the giants of retail. And also one commonality is that on the right side, where there's actually a bigger proportion of real estate customers. Uh, but also we've been the same happening in the winners in each, each of the nations and national level. Then, as we say that retail has been changing quite a bit, but of course, 2020 brought a huge acceleration of change. Retailers were faced with new kind of reality and actually they reacted to well. They adapted to cope with the new kind of reality quite well. I think all of you have been, I know that you've been working hard and been doing a good job. I think many bunch really good numbers in, in a difficult environment. So there's been introducing curbside pickups, new type of delivery models, having closed stores as delivery centers for the close, closed by customers and consumers, to building new partnerships for handling the final mile, picking from the stores, introducing new safety measures for employees and consumers to keep, keep things rolling. So there's been a lot of things coming in, actually quite a bit of more complexity also on how to run the process and run the supply chain. And many of retailers have had a lift in, in revenues, but also a lift in cost because of all of the increase in complexity and cost. And what we see now that's happening and what we believe that actually now is the time that the winners, the future winners in retail will be moving away from adapting to cope and just to stay on top of the market conditions to adapting to increase both their efficiency and offering to have a winning winning formula and winning proportion because if now if there's no streamlining of cost base and the operation currently there's a huge pressure both on the margin through the increased competition than and more complex distribution and operation structure in current world so what we've seen as big things that leading companies are developing. One is building a very granular demand forecasting to support the increasingly complex operations the retailers are having. Second thing is building end-to-end -end supply chain visibility to secure availability and sales. Third is unified retail planning. So looking at bigger part of the retail process and doing decisions in combined way to reduce cost of operations and fourth important thing is remain re retaining the adaptability because as we've seen that there's lots of chains and actually there's derived chains on for example currently lack of container capacity and so on and the leaders are actually very adaptable to could to still cope in the changing situation and make the best of of whatever situations they face. Then going more to detail on different areas, and I actually tried to build the presentation so as to prime you for these whole two days of presentations by having actually snippet examples of presenters and panel discussion customers so that you can actually start thinking on what would be the most interesting angle of questions and discussion with, with the presenters, customer presenters later. Looking at granular demand forecasting, uh, those who were on the uplifting sectors of retail like grocery or DIY, you know that at some stage forecasting wasn't the biggest challenge in the operational supply chain. It was more like how to optimize the flow of goods on constraint capacity through the DCs and shelves and what to do. So it wasn't a forecasting problem. But the fact is that there has been more permanent and in now many in many markets ongoing shift on on the structure of demand the level of demand have changed but also the sales sales channels have have changed there's more home delivery more consumer pickup 
and the structure on of sales between different product groups have changed. So it's very important for retailers and the winners are doing it. It's actually forecasting the level of demand in a granular level to the future. And the winners are looking at, for example, a year on a day level or within day level, just to kind of plan the operations, for example, customer service staffing to the right time of the day, store or fulfillment location, as well as the fulfillment type. And the fulfillment type is very important for reserving right amount of stock for different channels, as well as reserving right amount of labor for serving footfall customers to the store, as well as online picking. The detailed forecast needed for the accurate operations control in this supply chain is uh, <laughs> the detailed forecast is needed to control the operations in the more and increasing complex supply chain in the future. Then customer example of the vitamin shot. So how they used granular forecasting for further ex ex uh, efficiency. They started with kind of wishing for more information granularity and control transparency and, and so saw that that was holding the business back. So the vitamin shop they have quite a complex business with omnichannel channel sales structure, lots of promotions, very heavy in promotion, quite product wide product portfolio, as well as lots of new product introductions where you have much more uncertainty on demand what that happens as and uh, this challenging demand profile was leading to quite a bit of manual demand forecasting. What they were able to do by implementing more granular and accurate demand forecasting is for, first of all, change the nature of their planning by automating forecasting altogether, including the promotions and new product introductions. So there's a demand signal they can utilize to build those processes on as well as have a very well nicely segregated forecast for their e-commerce sales and use that automatically to ring fence or, or ensure that they have right amount of stock to serve the virtual uh, channels as well as, as allocate potentially constraint stock to the right channels for best sales and, and margin behavior. Then moving into end-to-end -end supply chain visibility and control. And of course, we talked about demand forecast granularity before, but as said in the heat of pandemic, knowing the forecast is not enough. It's very important to get the right amount of stock to right places. And if you have a wrong amount of stock, it's often even more important to allocate that to the as 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 well as possible. And uh, during the pandemic, of course, many of our customers utilized the possibility of looking at what does the future capacity and stock requirements look like with current demand scenario, and what if we would sell, sell even 10% more than the current forecast chase, and do a bit of what if scenario on that. And this was done to find out the constraint places and bottlenecks of the process. And for many of the customers, it was the DC picking. And of course, the savvy people used the transparency to do better business decisions. For example, limiting some of the assortment so that you have a bit less lines in the store and you can always send, for example, two cases in a go and limit your picking lines and thus kind of easing the capacity constraint in the DC as well as what many customers did was actually plan around the issue and change some of the bulky items for direct store delivery and serve the DC capacity on that. And whatever you would do, we see that the winners actually make sure that the information they get from the transparency is also actionable. So that important exceptions are filtered out from the kind of noise of all of the data or the masses of data that most of the retailers have 
millions of tens of millions of <coughs> SKU stored combinations that you can access the data in a manner that you can very quickly root cause the data in the user interface as well as actually do actions and, and change on that. And when you see cer certain same exceptions or situations needing action recurring, you can start building automatic responses to that. Good example of that, that phenomena of a future winner is Big Lots, where they built end visibility and control to their supply chain to improve their operations. They came from the situation where they had lack of visibility, especially on the DCs and vendors, because the whole supply chain was not connected, but the inbound, so the good flows coming to the DCs and the outbound, what they were feeding to the stores and what was stored is some demand was not fully connected. And of course, then you, then you have a glitch. And if you know or even sense that there's change in the demand, you can't fully know what it means for your DC operation, capacity, transportation, or your vendors. So what BitClose was able to do in a project is to build full visibility for the, for the supply chain. So having SKU store day level forecast one year in the future, and actually then building from that a supply plan on how the DCs will supply each of the stores on each of the day in, in what stock, and not kind of from that seeing the capacity needed for moving the stock, as well as the stock requirements and, and the uh, inventory levels, both in stocks and DCs. And then using this transparent, actually building the plan also further on to the suppliers and being able to share the picture of, of future likely demand and inventory possessions to vendors also. And it was very important to have this transparency, of course, during the big demand shifts in, in the pandemic. And there's quite a bit of demand shift also after the pandemic, but not only having that transparency, but having also able ability to build automatic resolution of constraint situations, like for example, if there's shortage of some stock, how do we prioritize different demands and different channels or different stores, or, or how do we allocate it automatically fairly? Third point is the unified retail planning and, and uh, it's a big thing for us in Relex. And what we mean is actually having a thorough picture of your whole process and using the demand signal, not only to look at how you should position the inventory and how should you play your, with your stock in the supply chain, but also actually looking at the linkages between the store space and the demand and the supply because for example if you can flow goods right directly to the shelves without stopping it in the back room you actually save quite a lot of labor and by default have more accurate inventory records by that because you don't have multiple places for for the same stock as well as taking into care the linkages between pricing and inventory and when, for example, driving down stock or workforce that's needed to uh, do goods received and stock the shelf with, with the incoming goods. So, so linking the different areas together. And uh, it's very clear from our viewpoint that the true winners of tomorrow are the ones that actually build unified business plans and start to utilize the visibility across the different functional areas of, of the operation. And when you start to get more visibility, not only to, to the supply chain capacity, but also what's happening in the labor, what are the labor requirements, compared, for example, the, 
to the hours you have planned in these stores. It's important as in the supp supply chain stock transparency to able to identify easy the exception situation where, where you should resolve, uh, react to and have methods to start resolving the, that. And examples on what we've been doing with our customers is that we identify automatically situations where there's too much, uh, or what is it, too much picking cases or lines in the DEC to supply. So, so it's not only inventory constraint, but labor constraint and actually plan on which days it is best to ship these volumes and move that volume to the, do the labor, labor requirement. One good example is, is PetSmart. There we started the retail optimization and unified planning uh, journey by building a better picture of future demand and stock deployment and stock allocation uh, to the future. So building, uh, improving the efficiencies in forecasting, replenishment, allocating new products and having a wholesome picture on what's the future stock in the supply chain. But PetSmart also identified the possibility of further improvement on that because they, they had a markdown process which was not uh, linked to the inventory planning process in any way. And they understood that if they use the same information of future demand and stock moves, they can both have a streamlined process by op unifying the both of the process, identifying uh, potential problem stock earlier automatically, as well as actually allocating the potential problem stock to the right places and optimizing both the markdown and allocation situations in the same time. And uh, that's, of course, I've been in the business of, of getting rid of problem stock really along. And there's, of course, you have a lot of novelty lines, you have seasonal business and so on. So it's impossible to purchase everything uh, perfectly and i've been very keen on all of the projects where we have now kind of proactive approach on getting rid of of the challenges or or kind of earlier scenes with the best possible margin then if we look at the fact on, on adaptability and what we see very much is that the winners combine efficiency with adaptation. And what we think of efficiency is, is making all of the millions small decisions of what should be the price of this product in this store today, or how many items or bananas should we ship to store A today, or, or how should we plan the shifts of labor for this store for these weeks. There's millions of decisions done, kind of small little decisions, and that more of them can be done more efficiently with intelligent automation, the more business benefit it drives. And if we think of granular demand forecasting, further supply chain transparency, automatic responses to exception situation, all of that drives that that efficiency and the kind of end goals there is the automatic or uh, autonomous operation that can make most of the decisions themselves. Then what we see at Relex is that that's not enough. Of course, as, as said earlier in the presentation, retail has been changing quite a lot in the last 15 years and the change is clearly just accelerating. And uh, any one of us who know kind of figures that they know for perfection what the future will be in three or five years is probably fooling themselves. So, so there will be kind of changes that we can't fully predict and most of us will be surprised at some stage. So it's very important to remain adaptive. And for adaptive, we mean the ability to react to external business pressures, but also basically the capability of innovate yourself and kind of being able to push the envelope and do new types of things and, and change your operation proactively on that. 
And what we see is that the biggest thing is actually combine the both is continue to innovate and actually we quickly also in new situations start to auto automate and build efficiency on the innovative new process. And if we think of building blocks for that, there is a couple of things for for automate autonomous process and efficiency. It's of course you need the technology for automation. There's plenty, plenty available and, and all the time improving by improvements of technology, AI processing power and so on. So it's an exciting time to be a basically technology vendor or retailer now, I believe. The really, really other big thing is data. And of course, when we are crunching data, we need the data in, how would I say, in a more stable condition, the data is the better you can kind of use it and optimize. And that goes to consumer data, point of sale, sales data, all of the transaction records, the log and so on. Third important is the competencies and processes on, on related to technology. Competencies on maintaining the data, gathering it, the data lakes, uh, processes there, uh, and henceforth. Then if we think of adaptation, it's also, it's important, technology is important, but there it is important not to have the most efficient, but also ensure that you have adaptive technology, something that that you don't basically blueprint for two years and build for five years and actually then notice after seven years that it's antiquated, but something that you can actually iterate with and then build new types of automation and, and optimization very quickly. Uh, second thing is very big. I, I do believe that that it's very important to have both in-house as well as in, with the partners understanding and competence on the process the total process and how it should be adapted. And one thing I'm quite passionate about is that is the unified retailer. And I see that one major constraint often is the kind of limited supply of smart people who understand the whole value chain and, and, and all of the different functions in retail. Because if you try to build a process that, that joins, joins the areas, individuals or even teams that understand the whole process are extremely valuable and that would be one one of my recommendations is to ensure that that you have such capabilities and the third very important thing is that what i been seeing very much that the ones who get further on in innovation is the ones that have a, ones that have a culture and attitude of of improving themselves and kind of one of the most working mottos there is kind of quite quickly is that the day that we we cease to grow better is the day that we cease to be good is the kind of the drive to push the envelope and, and continuously improve if we then think of of what we see of retail chains and growth after the pandemic and why we see that it's quite clear that it keeps keeps increasing. Uh, there's the kind of four drivers of change we actually started speaking about sometime in the end of 2000 or mid 2019. And one of, one is market disruption and external shocks. And of course, the pandemic is is an extreme one for many retailers in Europe, the kind of blockage of, of Suez Canal was quite, the, quite an good example of really heavily impacting external shock also. Many processes and, and supply chains needed to adapt. So there will be turbulence on, on market. There will be new disruptive players that come in and actually start changing the game. Uh, Quick commerce is not the biggest thing. And of course, we quite keen on that. We, we work with market leaders like Delivery Hero and Flink on that, on that area. And it, it's not very big, but for some grocers, it's just attacking one of the most margin or, or best customer groups. Not known price sensitive, very central city center located people and, and kind of that 
even small volumes can lead to mar margin erosion. The other big thing is power shift more to consumers with the ultimate price transparency of e-com and especially mobile prices, uh, mobile issues, so that if you try to try to compete only with product supply and prices, it's very hard. And, and we see that that's, it's very much accentuated that it's, it's very hard to differentiate on product and price. And the competition is thus intensifying constantly. Uh, there's further urbanization and, and demographic change happening in many places. And of course, the real estate market on, on, or housing market is good show on how people are moving and how it adapts. And fourth important thing, which I at least hope that will grow increasingly important is sustainability. But in many ways, it's been an area with lots of talk and less action and uh, partially in goes a trade-off with some of the e fulfillment models. And of course, they need to be at least very well managed to be energy efficient. But my understanding and perspective is that it's actually both by regulation as well as voluntary action by many of the retailers growing more and more important in decision making and will be driving many of the decisions decisions in the future, which is a very good thing because then also our children can have a better future. Then if we look at living retail and future winners, we see that the move towards automatic adaptive planning will happen in different phases. First of all, starting with intelligent automation and going from that to a bit more unified planning. So understanding and seeing a process in a big, big, larger picture. And in this phase for most retail, it's very important to, to be able to kind of understand and see and, and feel and look the process in longer longer term more comprehensively be able to do what if and self diagnose and see all of the challenges and basically have a digital win twin of the process they are using and what happens and uh, after that the kind of next steps are unified optimization so having the ability to optimize further decisions, for example, labor staffing and stock supply at the same goal. And of course, this needs for more integrated solution and more coherent data between, between the different areas where the solutions are utilized. And the kind of end state or goal state is the unified constantly adapting solution and of course then we need very good good data amounts as well as quite all encompassing AI and uh, for most companies that's still still in the years to come and, and but a very good goal. Yeah, what we see at Relex and what we believe is that winner, winners will take the journey towards living retail, but both by both improving their efficiency and automation of uh, different decisions and going towards autonomous processes, as well as ensuring that they have both the competencies and capabilities to remain adaptive and change as the future changes or that basically new business oppor opportunities and what we see also that the winners actually are able to create the era of living retail which is constantly kind of changing and evolving and my kind of big hope of course is that many of you would would join or take on the journey of going towards further automation as well as kind of ensuring adaptiveness to the future it, in many ways, it's not easy always. And as I like to say, everything that has true value requires work, at least from someone or some, some people. 
it requires quite a bit of work but what i found is that it's at least it's very intellectually fascinating it's at least for such retail geek at myself or process geek it's it's very it's very kind of nice and cool to try to optimize processes it's financially extremely rewarding going step by step it's very easy to ensure very quick returns of investments and paybacks within calendar and henceforth and actually use the gains to always finance the next steps and of course whilst being kind of intellectually fascinating it's also very great fun because it's very very key to see new kind of improvements and new type of processes come and innovation is is a real hoot thank you very much all and i really hope that that presentation has kind of arose arose in some nice questions and we can have a good lively discussion that was fantastic thank you so much miko and i think we have a lot to look forward to with advancements in forecasting visibility retail planning and automation and i absolutely love that you said that innovation is going to be the future because that's really what it's all about and what we're talking about today so before we let you go let's take a few questions from the audience so the first one i have is you know that from covid we've seen a huge increase increase in online sales and e-commerce. Um, how do you see that this has impacted the operations of retailers around the world? Yeah, that's a kind of interesting one. And it's, it's a, I've been talking with over a dozen retailers who probably have had a very kind of stable labor profile for a dozen years or so. So basically they know roughly that if they sell with an X amount of of euros or dollars on, on how many, what kind of staffing they need for <coughs> different things. And then many of our customers also switched to more and more store-based e-commerce picking. And that was one of the big changes that actually the labor profile started changing quite a lot. And if you, if you normally, you were basically, how would I say, store picking for, for example, or a grocery, retailer was like a hobby you would have one or one and a half person do that and you would have orders and so on then then you actually start building volume for 10 percent 20 percent and, and it, it, you can see possibilities of it going if you just have the capacity to fulfill one band actually the operation changes really a lot you, you need to have lots of hands planned in there to pick those you actually need to refill the shelves faster to do that you need to ensure that you actually don't congest the, the aisles yourself from consumers or with with several several pickers so so the operational impact of the channel shift combined with the volume increase was very big for many and had impacts both on of course on assortments via ensuring the capacity as well as labor profile and one very big thing which is still ongoing was that the availability of supply for retailers have not been actually as uncertain in decades definitely not that uh, not in the 25 years i've been working with supply chain absolutely you know workforce is a huge huge topic of conversation right now and i think we're gonna get into that a little bit later as well one of the other questions that we have from the audience is regulation and consumer sentiment seems to be gearing towards further importance of sustainability and this is something i'm really curious about too how do you believe retail should address the issue from my viewpoint there's kind of couple of things of course we 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 as a company i personally we have a war against food waste so first of all is take out the easy pickings that correlate directly with with better financial returns is to ensure that you you forecast and replenish all of the fresh goods in the best possible manner so that you actually have less wastage and market leakage from that as well as you ensure that you can serve the consumers with the freshest possible goods because it's We've seen, we've seen actually many cases where, for example, the retailers, by cutting up 
the most abundant displays of of the uh, chilled products can ensure better dates for the consumers and actually increase sales whilst both both basically minimizing the, the wastage quite a bit then the other one is i believe in sustainability very much on what you measure is what you get so so having a good kind of finger and understanding on the total resource consumption of of the whole of the process and trying to start optimizing that comprehensively and uh, <clears throat> at least at least if we look at the regulation i do believe that more and more of that environmental impact will be within the next year also correlating quite a bit or or better than today with the cost so you know like starting cost savings before the cost starts realizing Absolutely. And, you know, sustainability strategies are huge for a lot of companies and organizations right now. And it's really important that they work with their partners within that strategy to make sure that they can help along the way in a variety of different areas when it comes to sustainability, because sustainability is really broad, right? Yep. All right, so let's get to the third question that we have from the audience. So electronic channels make competition fierce and the same products available everywhere. How should retailers differentiate themselves for sustainable competitive advantage? This is a tough one, <laughs> kind of something <laughs> I've been trying to think, ponder a lot I, I this is kind of my personal perception is that of course there is a retailers are different but if i try to look globally across the companies i know that some of the biggest ones or some of the most successful ones that actually keep both defending their part of the market and growing is that they they choose what they stand for and and from my viewpoint it's having the clarity that i as a consumer when i shop there i actually express some part of my identity and it could be that that i express and feel myself as a very logical person by by having good deals from an aldi little or costco or, or walmart or i express my identity that that i treat myself and my family to a nice meal so i want to go to a marx spencer food for for friday night dinner con things and so on and uh, combining that kind of place in the market and of course all of the back end all of the processes and the offering needs to be very kind of fitting on that and it's a constant game to stay sharp on on, on the game on the, of that but what I see that that the retailers that that's basically the brand, but it's 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 also the identity of the retailer and what they want to be. And it's easiest that if you just really can choose what you stand for. What do you think? Because I hear this a lot. What do you think about supply chains being that competitive advantage for organizations? I I think it's that. How would I say? Without efficient enough supply chains, you, you can basically die in a way. Mm -hmm. If you don't, if you can't so get true. the products to the consumers, of course you die. If you, and if you, especially if you want to express kind of low enough pricing to be the person for rational shopping and constrained ranges and so on, it requires quite heavy quite opti quite heavily optimized processes otherwise you just can't command enough margin to survive and the more also if you have wider right ranges and lots of delicacy items a lot of spoiling items and so on once again you need to be able to manage it really well otherwise your just cost base starts plummeting and you can't capture enough margin to survive 
Absolutely. And that's from, you know, manufacturing to last mile delivery. Well, thank you yeah. again, Miko. And, you know, it's true what they say. And I say this all the time. Collaboration really is the future of business. And I think, you know, everything that you talked about um, in your keynote today just really, really reiterates that.